is the story of derelicts, drunks, dope addicts, thieves, killers, crabs, liars, fornicators, escape convicts. Men rejected by their families, ignored by society, scorned by those who could have helped them most. Men wandering aimlessly, lost and alone, across a desert of degradation, disaster and despair. This is a story of these broken men. And it's the story of one man who stood at the crossroads of their distress and made of it a crossroads of redemption. Insight and exploration in depth of the spiritual conflicts of the 20th century. Insight. How do you do? I'm Father Kaiser. Paul Claudel, the great French playwright, says, there's only one real suffering, to be alone. He's so right. We are social animals. We didn't generate ourselves. For that, a family was required. And now that we have grown to educated maturity, we continue to rely on others in hundreds of thousands of ways. We need them for assistance and information and entertainment. But most of all, we need other people to help us love. For love is the fulfillment of the human personality. It gives us our greatest happiness. The human family is one, the human race is one great family. This is why human suffering is everyone's concern. The need of one man is the need of all. The degradation of one man is the shame of all. The suffering of one man is a scandal for all. I am more than my brother's keeper. I am my brother's brother. This relationship imposes obligations upon me. I must move to meet my brother's need. And I must learn to do it in such a way as to respect and enhance his dignity as a human person, rather than destroy it. The hero of today's program was able to do just that. The Nazi occupation of France did more than suppress the political life of the French people. It disrupted the French economy. It compromised the honor of this proud people. And in certain respects, it dislocated the soul of France. With liberation and victory, the prisoners taken during the Blitzkrieg of 1940 and the slave laborers deported to diminishing plants in the Ruhr and the Rhine came home to a hero's welcome. They settled down. They had won the war. But in many respects, they found the problems of peace more difficult than the problems of war. The French economy shifted to peacetime production. New methods were adopted. But there were thousands of Frenchmen who could not adjust to the new techniques of production. There was no room for these men in the new economy. Jobs were scarce and wages were low. Housing in particular was critically short. Men slept in the streets, in alleys, in vacant lots. Wherever they could find shelter from the wind and the rain, only the rich could afford the luxury of an apartment. Some families lived under tarpaulins in the fields outside Paris. Others joined two or three other families to share a single damp, stuffy, ill-lit room. Under such inhuman conditions, there was no privacy, no decency, no dignity of any kind. A sizable portion of the French population was in desperate straits. These were the victims of war, the casualties of change, the human debris of a selfish society. Take a look at me. Just another bum, you say. Not so long ago, I was not a bum. I was Djibouti or somebody. Back in 29, 30, 31, I, I drive a truck in Africa. From the Djibouti to Wadi Abab run. That's where I get my nickname, Djibouti. One time I come across two soldiers. They had this native tied to a pole. He's naked, and they're scorching his body with an acetylene torch. I hear him scream. I smell the burning flesh. I can't take it. Punch here, kick there. There's a big fight. One of the soldiers uses a knife here. After that, I had Africa. I come back to France. 
bang, the war comes. I'm called up with the first batch. I don't do much fighting. But I do spend two years in a German prison camp. Right out of the blue, my wife writes, she wants what they call power of attorney to sell the house. I never see her after that. My truck is taken by some bush. My wife, by some countryman. After the war, I drive a truck. One day I black out. I go off the road. That is the end of the truck and my job. I go to the hospital with this limp. I look for work. I even try a junkyard, but I can't hold a job. Old step and a half is too slow, the boss says. Where do I live now? I sleep where I can, with rags or paper for a blanket. Sometimes I steal. What do you do? You teach an old dog new tricks. Even if you can't forget the rags you wear, the garbage you eat, even if somehow you keep yourself clean and don't get stinking drunk, even if somehow you say to yourself, I am Djibouti, I am a human being, a man. What does it get you? You're a stranger, a foreigner in your own country. You don't live anymore, you exist. No ties, no responsibility. I'm really free. What's it worth? Free to live or die, nobody cares. But I keep saying to myself, real life must be somewhere else. It can't be this. Or so help me, we've all been betrayed, all of us. Hope is a luxury people like me can't afford. Uh, save your sympathy, maybe it makes you feel better. Me, it sticks in my throat like some of the garbage I eat. Down here where I live, there is no justice, no fraternity, no freedom, no God. Nobody wants to rent an apartment to a couple with a baby because babies cry and the tenants complain. It's happened to us five, six times. We tried renting a hotel room at night, but he took two-thirds of Marcel's pay. So what could we do? Marcel, my husband, he bought this tent on the vacant lot. Some place animals, they live better than we do here. Usually, Marcel is the strong one and he helps me to go on. But last night, he came home drunk. We had a terrible fight. I told him that I did not love him, but of course I didn't mean it. We're just both so beat down that we take our anger out on each other. And our hearts are sick and our souls are sick and I don't know what I'm going to do. I heard crying. In the nursery of my home? The tent? Well, in the summer it's really not so bad. We can sleep on the straw. And we're used to walking bent over because we cannot stand up, but uh, that inconvenience is really nothing because of this fine, fresh air. But this is November. The rains will make a swamp here. The little girl is no more than an infant. Oh, Noelle, she's two. Now, that's a ripe old age. My Lucette, she was three months. She was a healthy baby, and she had bright blue eyes like my Marcel. They said pneumonia killed her. I don't know. There's so much illness here. She had her pick. You can afford nothing else, my child. My husband, he has a decent job as an automobile factory. He's an honest worker. But there is nothing for us. There is no room. There is no apartment. Well, no house. I'm sure your family would help if they knew. I thought of going to my mother. She has a place in the country. But what kind of a marriage would that be without Marcel? Perhaps I can help. You know that I stayed in one of your charity places once with the baby? Marcel, he stayed at the Salvation Army. You know what we did? We met in the bistros at night, and we walked the streets together. It was wonderful. The nights were cold and the days were long. I know. I know. Well, you do. You're a priest and you know. You are only worried where the bishop is going to send you, to what rectory, whether or not your room will be drafty, whether or not it will have a fine view of the city, whether or not you'll have your favorite roast and the right wine. 
Well, monsieur, you go to your house. But where do I go? Into the tent? Please, please, perhaps I can help. Yes, I am a priest, but I am also a member of the assembly, you see. Ah, you are a priest. And you are also a politician. That's a wonderful combination. Perhaps you'd like to write a report about the children in the streets and those who don't have any work and those who are without homes. And you will say, my, my, this is really awful, my friends. Well, you let me tell you something. We are not names on a list. And we do not want to be numbers on your survey. We are people. And monsieur, when you pull the covers up at night, my friend, the priest, my friend, the member of the assembly, you think about us in our tent, all right? And you sleep well. I would like to be able to tell you that your main in Djibouti were isolated cases of destitution and misery. But I cannot. In France in 1950, there were thousands upon thousands of such individuals who were forced by circumstances to live on a material level incompatible with human dignity. And yet your main in Djibouti, like so many others, never lost their awareness of their dignity as human beings. They fought to retain that dignity. And when it was violated, they were outraged. The real scandal of Germain and Djibouti is not their want of privation, but it is the fact that their fellow human beings could view their need, could watch their degradation, and do nothing about it. Like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan, they walked by on the other side. Too busy, they thought, to get involved. Too busy, I guess, to really care. Let the government do what they said, or the charitable institutions, but don't look at me. I'm just one individual. I can't get involved. So it was in France in 1950. The problem was evident, and yet it was ignored. It was ignored until one man called it to the attention of the nation. He dared to face the challenge of human suffering, and he dared to do something about it. Thank you so very much for coming, Harry. Let me be perfectly frank. Were it not for your position, I would not be here. I've been noticing some of your cases down there. No, not cases, men. If it were not for them, I would not ask you to come here. Sit down, sit down. My dear Abbe, you are a priest, a gentleman. I know your family. Why do you involve yourself with this riffraff? Well, they are my helpers, my companions. They live here. In your own home? In our home, yes. Don't be clever with me. These men are derelicts, thieves, cutthroats. Why do you have them hanging around? Because they are suffering, Harry. Because their need is desperate. They are human beings and they have no place to go. Yes, I could smell some of their humanity as I passed them on the way in. Well, I am sorry if their humanity offends you, Harry. Think of them. They must live in it. Of course, of course. But you did not invent the obligation to assist the needy. My family has always contributed to worthwhile charities. And my wife and I have made it a custom of preparing Christmas baskets for the less fortunate. Now that is charity, Abby. Not allowing this absurd collection of beggars and worthless thieves to yes, work about your house worthless thieves and foul-smelling beggars. Don't you understand, Henri? These are the men who need us most. They need us. And they need us now, not when we feel like helping them. Oh, yes, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. They certainly have their faults. But no human being is worthless. Not one. Well, perhaps you see something in them I don't. Like the scientist who looks at uh, a drop of dirty water under his microscope, you see many things squirming about him. Hmm? Well... Perhaps you see something in these people that eludes the rest of us. I see Christ in the men. And if you would look beneath the filth and the scars and the sullen faces, you too would find the image and likeness of God in me. Mm -hmm. I am only a minister of the government, not a priest. What I see are animals. Human animals who fail to make the grade 
or refuse to try. This is a community of workers, not a poor house. Each man with a responsibility, each man helping someone less fortunate than himself. That must keep them busy, finding someone less fortunate. It's too easy. Henri, hmm? I have a new project. I bought a uh, tract of land. I want you to expedite our getting surplus materials from the government. You see, the men are building homes for families who have none. Even the Minister of Housing can give you surplus material. I intend to buy them. With what? With my salary as a deputy of the chamber. All right. That I can do. Good. And you'd like a sizable donation besides, hmm? <laughs> You anticipate me, Harry. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm only a deputy and you are the minister, huh? Yes, <laughs> and a very busy one. Oh, uh, one more thing, hmm? please. Uh, a special permit. You see, the houses we build are... Oh, very, very, very humble. When you have nothing, you are willing to settle for something less than the best. So, they might not meet the requirement, the zoning requirements needed in this land. Um, let me anticipate you again, or... You get these tramps to work... To uh, the Harry. Mm. Men. All right. You get these men to work for you for practically nothing. You build these modest houses uh, at rock-bottom cost and um, sell them to the needy. Right. <clears throat> now you propose, in return for this favor, to uh, allow me to share in the profits of this charitable organization of yours? Yes. And the profits are considerable, Harry. But not in money. We uh, give you these homes away. Give them away? To whomever needs them most. Oh, they pay whatever they are able so we can keep going, you know, build more homes. I see. Tell me, um, when does your term expire in the Chamber of Deputies? Next year. Ah. Well, there's plenty of time. Pictures in the paper. Abbe Pierre, friend of the proletariat, champion of the underdog. And that's more shrewd than I imagined. You might even get a large part of the communist vote in your district. I'm resigning from the Chamber of Deputies, Harry. I don't believe it. You have influence in the Chamber. You've noticed, Abbe. The uh, Archbishop has refused you permission. Hmm? No, 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 no. He leaves it to me. And I decided something must be done for these people now, by me. Well, if you're so determined to spend time and waste it all on uh, doing great deeds of charity and serving humanity, why don't you do it in the chamber? No, because noble words and elaborate plans are not what these people need, Henri. They need bread, and they need a roof over their heads, and most important, they need a simple respect for their dignity as human beings. I want to spend the rest of my life with these people, Harry, trying to... to save that for them. You will forgive me, but what a waste. To throw away your life, your career, your talent on human refuse, discards. Ah, but that is the point. Here, there will no longer be discards, don't you see? Ideals will not feed and clothe men. What do you intend to do for money? I don't know. I don't know. But God knows. And if he wants the job done, he... he'll get us the means to do it. God! Here, cathedrals built of surplus junk, incense of garbage and unwashed bodies, tramps and bums for acolytes. Do you think these are appropriate for God, Abby? You forget, Henri, where he chose to be born. In the months that followed, Abbe Pierre's tattered associates became more and more numerous. From all parts of France came desperate, destitute men. Djibouti was only the first. These men had lost all hope. They thought themselves worthless. Abbe Pierre put them to work building homes for women and children who had been sleeping in the streets. These men considered themselves the dregs of human society. Abbe Pierre showed them they had value. He showed them how to help those worse off than themselves. 
the housing development mushroomed. Germain and Marcel were joined by scores of other families. Within several years, the development had become a small city. From all sides came those in need, men on the verge of despair, families without shelter of any kind. Money was scarce. There were so many to be helped. There was so little with which to help them. But still, the Abbey plunged ahead. Frequently at night, in his cassock and windbreaker, he walked the streets of the city, asking help from whomever he met. His associates began to collect scrap. From the waste baskets of Paris, they collected rags, furniture, books that could be sold in junk markets. In the city dumped, they worked as scavengers and collected a mountain of saleable items. Abbe Pierre worked with these men. He shared their world and he framed the guiding principle of their lives. It is not necessary to wait until we are splendid people to do splendid things. <laughs> that would probably mean waiting a long time. Too long, in fact. We need only to understand one splendid thing and then try to base our whole life in it. And that thing is, that splendid thing is, that the first person we must help in all things is the person who is suffering the most. In serving other people, we need to ask only two questions. Is this a human being? Is he in need? If he's a human being, then he's my brother, and I must love him as myself. If he's in need, then his pain is my pain, and I must do everything I can to alleviate it. There's nothing romantic about Christian charity. It takes much more than enthusiasm. Because loving other men is no easy job, for men so often on the surface are not lovable. It takes the microscope of faith to see in my suffering brother the face of God. But if loving other people is not easy, I can tell you it's rewarding. It gives man his greatest happiness. More than anything else, it gives meaning and purpose to his life, as it gives meaning and purpose to the lives of those whom he loves. Where's Noel? Djibouti. Uh, Marcel took her for a walk. I will uh, give her this. Huh? Oh. oh, she'll be just delighted. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, well, won't you have some coffee? I, I don't have much time. Oh, please. You've done so much for Noel and for all of us. Well, I know how it is. You've got a child. Not a bad little thing, that Noel. Oh, she's a different girl. Since we came here, we all are different. <laughs> yeah, I know. And you didn't look like much when you came, I tell you that. Oh, you are right. Oh, please, won't you sit down? I'll get the coffee. You know, I really feel like a woman now. Men, they are different. But a woman, she needs roots. She's got to have a house she can call home for her children, you know? Marcel, he comes home and he's relaxed. He looks at me and Noel, he doesn't feel guilty anymore. Oh, it's marvelous. I feel like a wealthy woman. And I thank you. Me? Thank the boss, the Abbe. Well, I thank everybody. You know, the Abbe, he came over this morning and, well, he looks tired. Oh, he's a fool. He always looks tired. He tries to do too much. People keep coming, you know. He can't refuse them. If he wants to kill himself, that's his problem. Well, you know him. He believes that birds of the air, lilies of the field stuff. God will provide, huh? Well, I wonder if he hasn't pushed his luck too far. Uh, who knows? So far, it's worked. But I wish this God of his wouldn't wait so long. Sometimes he seems to wait until the last minute. Yeah, sometimes he seems to wait until after the last minute. <laughs> yes. And sometimes I think we ought to help him, too. <laughs> but... Would you tell me, Djibouti, you are going to stay here with us, aren't you? No, I, I can't spend my whole life picking rags, building homes for people I don't even know. So you think you will be moving on? I didn't say that. Well, this place, the feeling it gives you, it, it makes it hard to leave. Why? Before I came here, I was full of hate. I spit at everything. Whatever I did, whatever I saw, I spit at it. I hated God. 
What did God have to do with it? How could there be a good God who let me go through what I was going through? Did Father try to convert you? He knows better than to try to tell me that stuff about God loving me. I give him this, though. He did try to tell me and show me something like that. Well, maybe there is a good God. God who might love me. Because of men who love, like the Abbey? No, because of men who hate, like me. We come bitter, resenting everything and everybody. Uh, some of the guys even thought they would play him for a sucker, the Abbey. I know how it is. Hate can feed on itself, but here, somehow, it dies. Why, I don't know. Uh, the Abbe is a shrewd one. Uh, he puts you to work. Whatever you do best, no matter what you have done before, uh, and for somebody worse off than yourself, uh, it gets to you. One day you wake up and you see a different world. Same people, same trees, same everything, but different. You are different. Important. Somebody needs you. All at once you got something to, to live for because you've got something to give. Your life, it is going someplace. The hate is gone. It drains off like bad water and it leaves room for love, I guess. The ultimate tragedy for a human being is not poverty or pain, disability or death. The ultimate tragedy is a failure to love. God created us to love. If we fulfill that purpose, our lives are successful. If we do not, our lives are a failure. It's as simple as that. Djibouti, in the beginning of today's story, is a tragic character because he has allowed the sufferings and frustrations of his twisted life to isolate him from other men and make him bitter and resentful. He was a tragic character because he had stopped loving. But by the conclusion of today's story, Djibouti has rediscovered the meaning of human life. What has produced the change? The entrance into Djibouti's life of someone who loved him not for what he had done, or for what he could do, but simply for what he was, a human being made in the image and likeness of God. Abbe Pierre was willing to initiate love, to give love before it was returned, to give it even if it was never returned. Once Djibouti began to experience, his personality opened out. He began to love in return. And he began to express his love by working for others. And once he perceived that his work was valued, and that he was needed, the transformation was complete. This program is not an appeal for funds for the poor of Paris but it's an appeal to you to start your own insurrection of kindness. I ask you to start today not with a thought, not with a resolution, but with some simple act of kindness. As St. John of the Cross said, where there is no love, put love, and there you will find love. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their God by serving those outside their church.